when I was, you know, 17 years old, I had decided that I would die an actor, you know? Um, so once that decision was made, uh, in some ways it made the nose easier, you know, because yes, you're right. There were going to be 10,000 of them, but that then, but then after 10,000, you know, 10,001, if I, if I know I'm going to be around yeah. sooner or later, you know, sooner or later, it's going to be that thing of like, yeah, you know, I always liked that guy. If you've got something, let it rip. I'm never going to do this again. Everybody grapples with this idea that you're really a fraud. Like I'm alive. And that's when it clicked with me. I thought these are not superheroes. These are just men that can do super things. First of all, thank you for for doing it. It's um, the speed with which you answered me was amazing to me. I mean, I, I was like, I'm, I don't know. If, I was like, I don't even know if I want to ask you because it, you know you're so busy you got so many things going on so uh totally appreciate it and um it it kind of you know i've been i've been kind of racking my brain about where i would start with you because there's kind of so much to so much to cover that i don't even i don't even know how much we could go into your work because as i you know working with you is one thing knowing your body of work realizing as we we're sitting down i'm like let me just kind of out of respect, let me kind of refresh myself. And I'm just like, holy crap. I mean, not only have you just worked so much, but who you've worked with, like the 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 directors that you've worked with, it's it's ridiculous. Um, so I don't even know if I want to go there or just start with like one thing that comes to mind with you is like watching you through this quarantine has been really cool to see how you've responded and pivoted and and um it's kind of appropriate for my show which is all about overcoming uh obstacles and rejection and all that but you, you've mm -hmm. kind of like it's been beautiful to see from afar and up close a little bit what you've done just on instagram what you did with play on what you've done mm -hmm. with six degrees and and you mm -hmm. seem like you're having fun the whole time too i don't know if that's an illusion or, or what but uh how do you yeah I mean, I think that, um, well, I'll start with my thoughts about social media. And that was that when social media first popped up, I remember one of the first things I heard about was Facebook. And the idea was that um, it would be a way to uh, connect with people that you'd lost touch with from, from the past. And I thought to myself, that's the worst fucking idea I've ever heard in my life. That's the last thing in the world that I want to do. And, um, and, and then I start, sort of, you know, Twitter kind of rolled around and it was like, you know, people sharing things about their personal lives. And I was very, very opposed to it. I thought this is not, this is not what I'm interested in doing. Like, I don't like doing interviews. I don't like having people over to my house to take pictures. I, it was completely counterpoint to everything that I, I believed about being an actor. Any kind of publicity that I've ever had to do in my life, I've always done because I thought it was kind of part of the job or that it was really just a tool in which to give people more access and more awareness of the projects that, that I was in and that that was going to work, was going to breed work in that sort of way. Um, I went into it because of sixdegrees.org, because I had started this, you know, charitable organization, and and it was fundamentally uh, born out of the idea of uh, uh, social media with a social conscience. So there was no way for me, kind of, not to, you know, embrace that whole um, that whole world. You know, I've since kind of come around to it. I think it's changed a lot and it's shifted a lot and it really becomes, um, well, first off, it has been kind of fun. You know, I've always made dumb little videos to send to Kira or, you know, funny shit to send to my family or whatever, or, uh, you know, enjoyed, you know, playing music and stuff. So 
Uh, this is just a, a bigger platform on which to share it. But also during the pandemic, I found it really helpful because I'm just somebody that really likes to work. And I really like to get up in the morning and have something to do um, and something to um, work towards. So even if it's something stupid that I'm going to go play, play music to my goats or whatever, you know, it, it, at least it gave me a, a, a function and a, and a purpose in, in during the course of, of that day. You know, once, you know, I don't spend all, you know, I, I, I work out, but I'm not going to spend three hours in the gym. It's just not my thing. I'm not that much of a reader. I pick up my instruments, um, but I don't pick them up for six hours at a time, like, you know, Eddie Van Halen or something like that. Um, so I need to have something to do. And Kieran and I were talking the other day about, I'm sure you felt this. Um, as we start to see the light kind of at the end of the tunnel of the um, the pandemic, we were first, um, you know, you and I were were working on the show, and around March 13th or something like that, they shut us down, and we didn't know how long it was going to last. I bolted for uh, LA because I felt like it was it felt like a, a crisis and I felt really strongly that I needed to be with uh, the core of my family during this crisis, you know, in the same way that I did after 9-11. And um, so I came to LA, Kira was here, the kids were here. And for months and months, it was, we, we weren't seeing my daughter. It was just my son and my wife and I in, in our house out here and just kind of waking up, moving from room to room, in, in a sort of almost dreamlike horror state of a really strong um, underlying fear of not knowing uh, what was gonna happen, not knowing if we we're gonna live through this, not knowing if the world was gonna live through this. And, and I think that a lot of people suffered a lot of trauma around that. Um, and I just flashed on it, you know, the other day. So I think as a way to kind of combat that um, that uh, underlying uh, terror and uh, feeling sort of helpless and powerless, I and all of us turned to creating stuff, you know, play on. Uh, Karen and I made a short uh, film. We, we uh, wrote and directed a, you know, our own film. I did a whole bunch of, you know, Instagram things and, and it was, it helped, it helped me personally a lot to, to get through the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. I mean, when we, I, I left New York March 13th as well, they told us, I think they originally told us we were going to be down for two weeks. Right. And mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to grab my stuff. I'm going to grab. And I literally swept the apartment. I went to JFK. I was actually coming back to see the family that the next day anyway. And I just, I called JetBlue, went to JFK and was on a plane and like, an hour and nobody was in my row. I think I have a picture on Instagram of it. There's like, it was very surreal. And I had the same, same deal as you. I got home, it was like two in the morning and I get in an Uber from LAX and I had, we didn't know anything at the time, you know, so there's no right. masks, there's no nothing. I, I had the windows open. I'm trying, I'm hoping the guy doesn't talk to me and just wondering, you know, like, what's next and what what is going on here and i i pivoted heavily into the podcast and like it's it's interesting to, to hear your relationship to social media because mine was similar it wasn't until i had the podcast where i really got behind it because mm -hmm. i had something that i felt was something that i was proud of that wasn't just me going like hey look at me it was like hey that, that i actually think this is maybe helping people and so i got behind it but watching you do it like it's it, it was it was my biggest thing as we we're about to sit down was like you have this way and i don't know if it feels this way for you on the inside but this way of making it look like what you're doing is just it seems like it's fun like 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 your monday blues is awesome like i got my predictions that will be a tv show at some point it'll be somewhere because it's just it's pretty cool like you love music you you put it together. You seem to have a good way of like taking what you love to do and then going, all right, let's just turn this into a vehicle without thinking too much of the, of the potential pitfalls. You seem like you kind of just, just, you know, run into a burning building and you're like, whatever, 
that I don't know if is that is that accurate in describing you? And is that something that's more as of late, or is that something you were kind of brought up to 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 think in that way, where you don't well, you don't seem like you take yourself too seriously? Am I don't I, take myself too. Yeah, I don't take myself too seriously. I do take my work extremely seriously. I agree with that. And, and so, you know, I just happen to be someone that has those two things going on. I mean, to me, I think, you know, when I see actors who I think are, listen, I'm not going to judge. For me, I just don't think I need to take myself that seriously. And I also, I don't think about, um, I do think about pitfalls. I will, I will say that. I mean, uh, I think you kind of, have to you know I, you know because y you know that e even before our current state of you know um y you know the the ability to get canceled is you, you can say stupid shit and it's going to haunt you for a really long time and that's not going to be you know that that's not going to help you be in a situation to do your work so I, I do think i do think about what i say and you know for the first time in my life i've i've actually been more open and willing to listen to the advice of other people around this thing you know and i do um have people that help me with the you know the concepts of social media um you know i um i, I remember reading i heard a uh, uh that wasn't read it was a it was actually a it was a podcast where a woman um was talking about where social media was at and the use of it and et cetera and and she said something really interesting, which was, you know, you can definitely make the decision not to do it at all. And that's in and of itself a, a decision that's 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 valid and probably, you know, uh, you know, creates a certain kind of mystique or or whatever. Or people can lean into that because they can't find you on social media. She said, but if you're going to do it, you're better off trying to do it well, just like anything else, you know. Right. whatever well means for you you know i mean you look at certain people's accounts and they they just focus on one specific thing and they do that really really well and they do it a lot so i took that advice because i i felt like okay that's an interesting thing and so i talked to some people and and, and continue to talk to people about um, the best ways to use it now what i actually am getting from it that's something that's very um it, it's hard to you know qualify you know um, sometimes people like it, you know, uh, but whether or not it, it has any kind of effect on me pursuing my dreams or, or, you know, being able to keep working or, or make money or whatever it is. I, 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 I don't really know. I think the jury's kind of out on that. <laughs> yeah. 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 It is. Hard. It's kind of, um, well, that's like publicity in general. You always wonder yeah. like how, what, what right. is it? Is it really? Well, you know, you've anything? done you've done junkets where you go and you know you sit there and you do like eighty interviews and you never see a single one and you think, Jesus Christ, why did I spend all this? Did this really help? I don't know. I mean, I've done junkets, press things. You know, I'm I'm pretty open to trying to support my projects that I've been in, and some of them do well and some of them don't. And I don't know that it's really necessary. I mean, I guess the more interviews you do, you're you're somehow you know, hoping to reach an audience, but I, it's hard to, it's hard to know what the actual impact is. Yeah. See, it's interesting for me to hear you saying that. Cause there are times with me where I go, like when we were in New York, when I was in Brooklyn, so I was without my family. I mean, you know, and I was like, I mean, I was a King on social media, you know, like putting stuff out. And then I come home and I'm like, I don't really feel like doing, you know, there are times when I'm just like, I don't really feel like it. it's interesting it's like sometimes i go like is the you know is the tail wagging the dog or what like why am i doing this what what am i doing and then i always go back to if i believe in what it is that i'm posting then okay that's that's cool and if not sometimes there are just periods where um it feels like i don't necessarily want to be so active there and i'm wondering to hear you say that there's a little bit of a means to an ends with it is is interesting because i just think of you i'm like i don't know if this is how you are in your own head but i think like there there's going to be work for kevin bacon you know there's going to be good work you you don't think that, that that's a that's a whole can of worms right there man no, that, 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 that's the whole thing right there is that no i never count on work i never i just can't i'm just not the, the 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 days of of hand to mouth and and you know this is 
you know, what your show is about. They, 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 they cut, they, they were, the, the, the road was paved so deep and so well during those days that I always think to myself, this is my last gig. I always think to myself, um, I'm going to be discovered, you know, emperor with, with, you know, emperor's new clothes that, you know, that I can't really act and that I'm, you know, uh, pretending. I always think uh, I will not become, you know, relevant, whatever that means. And I, in my heart of hearts, I, I feel like I will work, but, um, but, but it's hard to really, really trust that. So if I get, if I get out of work, I'm, I'm, I'm actively thinking about the next step. So to answer your question, yeah, I mean, I don't think, honestly, I would do social media just for fun. I mean, yeah. I, I think I would rather do other things for fun. I mean, I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I would, maybe I would. It's hard to say. I mean, I do think that sometimes um, I remember Vine was, I thought Vine was an interesting thing, which, you know, obviously didn't work, but I guess, you know, TikTok has kind of taken over for it. Um, in that people were making these little films. And uh, one of the things that's changed a lot since I became an actor, which I think is a really cool thing and a really huge step uh, in, in the right direction in terms of people's creative expression is the fact that if you have one of these, you can make a movie you know, you can edit it, you can shoot it, you can, you know, score it, you can, you know, do whatever you want. And even if these movies are four minutes long, it's a cool way to express your yourself. And I think that in that way, I, 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 I like it because I think the creating visual and audio, you know, filmic kind of content is something that I've just, uh, you know, I've always done. So it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that uh, happened between you and I over this quarantine that made, you know, your stock was already up here with me, but it went up even further when I found out that you um, you guys made your own film. I thought it was on a on the farm. You showed me that link. Um, uh, it, it was just so cool for me to see, you, you know, and even talking to you, you have that. Uh, it's it shocks me on one hand because you in my from where i'm standing it seems like you came out of the gate so strong in the beginning that i always think oh he didn't have the lean years that i had but but i had henry winkler on the show and he said the exact same thing he's like the reason i work so much because he always felt like he's like i felt like i was short and i was never gonna like it, it was he's like i always have that feeling that i'm never gonna work again and yeah. so so i i get it but I, what i love is that you you know just on your own that this this need to create you made the short film and it was really cool. And you, you shot it, you had lav mics. I have since gone and gotten my own lav <laughs> mic. So I was doing it for my self tapes, but now I'm starting to experiment with stuff. It's just, it's like, um, it's nice to see that you, you know, whether you realize it or not, you, you've been at the, the pinnacle of this business for, for so long and still it kind of gets you out of bed in the morning to go create regardless of who's going to go who regardless of who's going to see it just to express yourself that to me is really cool and what it's all about and probably why you will i think that you will just continue to be people will want you to be working with them because that's a spirit that's that's kind of um it, you know it's infectious that that's what it is um i have that i have that desire to create there's no doubt about it yeah so tell me about the like with music Mm -hmm. compared to acting you know you you kind of you're a real renaissance man writing directing acting producing uh music where does that kind of weigh in your world in terms of satisfaction because i'm i mean i'm a hack i got a guitar here a keyboard mm -hmm. here uh, you know i'm not i wouldn't call myself a musician um but i i can enjoy the the, the performance um and i would imagine for you performing in front of a live audience as a musician has got to be, it's a different beast than being on a set. What, how much do you love that comparatively? 
Well, uh, you know, the, the, the backstory is that uh, I grew up in a, in a household, uh, the youngest of six. Uh, there was a big gap between me and my next sibling, um, eight years. So I was, in some ways, um, there were many years that I was kind of an only child because our, our family traditionally left home very, at 16. Almost all of my brothers and sisters, including myself, you know, left, left home around 16 or 17. But my brother um, and my older sister, Hilda, were both uh, real good musicians and um, very uh, trained. My sister played guitar. My brother was in orchestras, cello, oboe. He's that you know, kid kind of, you know, uh, you know, uh, from orchestra, you know, kind of nerdy, you know, type practicing all the time and stuff like that. Um, but then also put rock bands together. So I heard them playing in bands, writing music, really kind of grew up listening to that. Uh, I really came to it. I came to it from the songwriting sort of point of view, which is kind of strange. I, I think I wrote my first song when I was 12. My idea was that I was writing it for Michael Jackson. And it was a, <laughs> my songs were all about, yeah, my songs were all about, um, Michael Jackson and I were around the same age. So I, you know, I love the Jackson five and, and, uh, they were huge, you know, when I was 12 and, um, you know, they were all about heartbreak and yeah, cause I was, I can't remember a time in my life when I wasn't like in love. Like, I mean, that, those were like my earliest memories as a child were like some woman, usually an older woman, I mean, I'm talking about, I was really, really young when I was like, oh my God, I'm so in love with her. And so, you know, I would write these songs, I'd sing them to my brother because I didn't play an instrument and he would um, figure out the changes and sort of construct them into something that would sort of, sort of seem like a song. And sometimes he would record me and uh, kind of produce like tracks and stuff like that on, on these things. And so when I started playing the guitar, it was really just as a tool to write. And when it came to really putting in the 10,000 hours on the instrument, I just, I didn't, I couldn't be bothered, you know? I was like, well, I got, I got the three chords and now I'm gonna add another one and that's enough for me to write a song with, so that's cool. And if I wanna learn another chord, I'll, I'll learn it so I can fit into the song, you know? Um, <laughs> There's a great story I remember of uh, uh, the, I guess it was probably Paul McCartney I was listening to uh, talking about how somebody had, one of the guys had gone across town and had come back and had, was so excited because they had just learned a, a B7. And like all of a sudden, nobody knew that core. <laughs> they were like, oh, this is great. You know, and they all of a sudden they started using that chord in, in their song. So, you know, that's kind of the way I wrote. Um, so when the band and the music sort of came together, it was really a function of writing these tunes, having a, a, an experience, feeling something, writing the songs, melody, lyrics, having those two things kind of come together, playing them for Kira, uh, playing them with my brother. Some early in our, in our Bacon Brothers thing, we wrote a lot. We don't write that much together anymore, once in a while, but not that much. Um, and then saying, well, let's play them in front of people. And when we first put the band together, it was a buddy of mine from, from down in uh, Philly where I grew up. And he said, come on down. You'll call yourselves the Bacon Brothers. My brother said, you, we're gonna put, we're, it's gonna be an acoustic uh, uh, quartet. You're gonna play guitar. I said, I'm not playing the fucking guitar. He said, yeah, you're gonna play. I said, I can't I'm not gonna play the guitar in front of people. Are you out of your mind? He said, don't worry you'll learn these songs. We, we played, um, whatever we, whatever we played, I, I, I was able to learn. I mean, and I started woodshedding on, on just on this one set, you know, uh, practicing those songs a lot over and over and over some covers and mostly our stuff. And then we had a bass player and a percussionist. Um, so I did that one show and you know, it's kind of a cliche. I was terrified, Matt. I mean, literally my knees <clears throat> were knocking together. Like that's the only time I've ever experienced that. Really? And yet, yeah, I was fucking terrified. And yet when I got off stage, it was that thing, I gotta do that again. That was like, 
so, you know, and the adrenaline and all that stuff. And, and the, here's the thing about it. Well, two things. One is that back when I was in acting school, there was an exercise uh, that was part of the, um, I don't know if it was, if it was Strasbourg. I think it was a Strasbourg thing as opposed to a Stanislavski thing where it was called the singing exercise. And you stood in front of the class and you picked any kind of song. It didn't really matter. It could be happy birthday. And you would stand in front of class and you'd hold each syllable and note of the song for a long time. So basically you'd go, happy birthday. Nothing seems like a like who, who would do it? everybody <clears throat> everybody would just dissolve into tears um, from doing this exercise. I've done this. I've been in acting You've classes. Doing, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Been okay. In New York, and they, yeah, and I've seen this, and I've seen it over and over. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just, yeah, I, and I don't really know what it is, but it's something about the vulnerability of putting a note or. Um, going into your something about singing is is elusive and vulnerable and emotional and I think that's why we like music so much and why it becomes such so much the soundtrack of our lives and certainly singers you know that you know if, you know if I listen to Otis Redding or Teddy Pendergrass or something I mean I just I can't it's it, like the feeling that I get from them is so remarkable and that in combination with the fact that I, I grew up doing a lot of theater. And when I first moved to New York, um, I was working off Broadway a lot um, uh, in, you know, really crappy little theaters all throughout the village or, you know, wherever. And <clears throat> the thing I loved about the theater was that you shared this one night with these people that was never going to be exactly the same. And you never knew what was going to happen. And when you stand off stage and you're about to walk onto the stage, you get butterflies. Um, to this day, I get butterflies if I'm playing in the band or I'm doing theater. And I think the butterflies are an important thing for a creative person to experience. You know, when I walk on the set of City on a Hill, <clears throat> you know, I love it. It's, I can take risks, but that's like being in my living room. You know what I mean? I grew up on sets, you know? And <clears throat> when, you do th when you do live music or you do theater, there's no take two. So I think that that was a big part of what I needed um, in my life. And I think that in some ways, for better or for worse, the, uh, the music kind of took over that live part of my creative process. So I sort of stopped doing quite as much theater and there just wasn't room for it. But yeah. uh, it, it still feeds me and I, I still dig it. When's, when's the last time uh, you did a play actually? And, and do you have a desire to get back, back on stage at some point, like in a straight play? Or is that not something that's on your agenda? It's always on my agenda. Um, I did a play probably about two years ago um, at the Hartford stage, which is a beautiful theater up in Hartford, Connecticut. It was a, um, a new adaptation of Rear Window, uh, which was made into a, started out as a, as a book, a thriller kind of written in the, I guess it was forties maybe. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, the writer Keith Rudine had an interesting kind of take on it where he took the real writer's life, which was very bizarre. He was a closeted, um, very tragic gay guy who um, actually had to have his leg amputated and ended up in a wheelchair, which is where the whole rear window thing ah. um, came from. And he, um, was a very tragic character kind of died tragically but they took his life and adapted it to the story and and it was really cool i mean i really liked it, it you know the the plan was for broadway and i it was really sort of an out of town test you know both 
for the show, but also for me to see if it was something that I wanted to keep doing and, and ultimately we decided not to um, move to Broadway, but that was the last thing that I did and it was fun. And I always, I'm always thinking about uh, theater. I, I really am. I mean, I, I, I love it. Um, it was great to get back on the stage. It'd been, it'd been a few years. Uh, so yeah, I'd love to do another play. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't been on a stage since, I mean, it's kind of crazy since 2008, I did mm -hmm. something up in San Francisco at ACT. It was awesome. I did a mammoth play. It was so much fun, but you, you know, even hearing you talk about it, I'm like, God, I, I need to, you know, I've done readings and stuff like that, but, um, ACT it, it was so cool too, because it's like, you know, you, you, you have these, these regional theaters and they, they are just so well run, right? And they're just- oh, so it was such a beautiful theater. And it was, yeah. you know, that beautiful three tiers of audience and and um, and that play particularly was like getting shot out of the cannon. Like I, I only left the stage for like three minutes. What's that? We did Speed the Plow. Uh, I played Bobby Gould mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, it was, it was great, but it, it's been a long time. And, and, um, you know, that even hearing that, that you went, you did this, you kind of tested it out of town, see if you're going to go to Broadway, if you want to do it. Um, I'm thinking about something we talked about, uh, your podcast. There was the, there was the podcast that was kind of a, a scripted show. And I listened, mm -hmm. I thought it was really funny. And at some point when we saw each other, I said, Oh, is that, you know, what's happening? And you're like, no, it's not going. And I thought, I thought like it, it's, just, it's just so interesting to me that I think my listeners in particular, it's good for them to hear this. Like uh, it, it never ends in terms of that, that kind of figuring out it, is something going to keep going? Is something going to work? Like you said in the, in the top of this interview, which is actually shocking to me that you go, I don't know if I'll work again, but like, how have you come to terms with it? Like, what do you, what, what is your um like do you have any any kind of strategies or mindset maybe it's not fixed maybe it's just something that instinctually you do but when you are in what you would consider to be a slump maybe the rest of the world wouldn't notice it mm -hmm. how do you manage that anxiety deal with it uh is there any kind of technique or something yeah, I mean, I don't know if I, I think some of it is instinctual. I think one of the things that uh, I've always sort of had is a lack of a rear view mirror so that I'm thinking down the road and I have, I, I remain hopeful, maybe that something is something cool is going to be right around the corner, even if it feels like it's not. Um, I like to think that I like to try to convince myself that my best work is in front of me. I also do a thing where I kind of secretly dream big, but practically work small so that, you know, ever since I was a, a kid and decided to be an actor, I thought to myself, one day I'll have my name on a marquee. I'll be on the Tonight Show. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to, you know, have you know, beautiful wife, whatever the kind of things were. But I ne But those were just like things that I only kept to myself. And then in my day-to-day -day sort of life, I would say, uh, I need to get a job as a busboy because I need to pay my rent. I need to see if I can find uh, some extra work because I'm trying to get a, you know, a, 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 a SAG card or an after card, whatever it was. And I'm hoping that this extra work is going to turn to an under five. You know what I mean? It's like I was always thinking very kind of like practically about the steps yeah. to get to the big thing, but not being too overcome with the big thing. So sort of taking that and putting it aside, you know, in, in my mind. And, and that's, that's really the, that's still the case, you know, I mean, there's still things that I want to um, accomplish. I also think that, huh, you know, I, yeah, th this idea of a, a, an absolute hard and fast game plan is it's kind of cool um, I don't know that I've ever really, it's, that's ever really necessarily worked for me. It's, it's been more just, if I just hang in there, you know, something, something, something hopefully will, 
will come down the line. And, um, and then personally, in order to get through the rough times and get through the disappointments, look, we don't, I mean, well, let's just go, let's just say in no uncertain terms that being an actor is you're signing up for a lifetime of rejection. You know, if you look at my IMDb page, I mean, a very small percentage of those movies either were well received, made any money at the box office, or um, or gave you know were were that great for me really? You know what I mean? I did a shit ton of movies that nobody fucking saw, and 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 it's just the longevity and the percentages that like four or five of them ended up being, you know, either good or hits, you know what I mean? It's it's just, it's, I am really the definition of throwing the shit against the wall to see what sticks. Well, you know, I, I really am. So, you know, that's what I just kind of, I'm going to try to keep doing, I guess. Yeah. Well, I don't even know if I go there because I you actually said something that made me think I want to kind of go back to a little bit of earlier childhood, but it, just in fairness to you, yeah, I get what you're saying. But just this morning, I was like, let me just kind of go. I, I scrolled through your IMDb, which takes four days to get through, by the way. And, <laughs> and I was like, let me just write down the ones that stick with me that are that are kind of like they and, and there is a long list here of movies like there are some films where I'm like, oh, that's right. He was in it. Like, I, I don't I mean, it, you're you're being very humble when you say that, but I get what you're saying. You, there's there's a large volume. Not all of them maybe are whatever. But you've you've worked with like the, I mean, I've wrote down a list. It's like Pete Berg, Scott Cooper, Clint Eastwood, Ron Howard, Barry Levinson, Curtis Hanson, Rob Reiner, Oliver Stone, Christopher Guest, John Hughes. It's you've you've had some real uh you know just I, I would imagine you know just some some great experiences with great collaborators none of them ever hired me again <laughs> <laughs> the only one the only no, one wait, no one, john he, wait didn't uh no, john well he, yeah barry levinson is hired barry levinson because city on hill right and ron, ron howard is hired, right but but not but for the most part not so often listen you know one of the things that really that i think um was was really important in terms of that was that when i started out there was you know in the movie business um people were like okay there's certain rules like you know you know once you're once you become the lead uh you know name above the title footloose right that's what you have to do now you got to be the guy from now on um and and i was like, okay, but what if I want to play like a really great supporting part? And after JFK came out, I really switched my whole thinking about that. Um, And I was willing, you know, very happy to reject whatever rules people were, you know, giving me for like what the rules of the industry were, because you know, um, William Goldman said, you know, nobody knows anything. And and that's just true. And, and, you know, so I said, okay, here's the things that I'm not going to look at when I'm going to take a role, the size of the role, the size of the budget of the film, or frankly, the size of my salary. I know that's a hard thing to get your, get your head, head around as a, as a, as an actor. But if, you know, we have, I'm not saying that, that actors shouldn't be paid every single dime that they are deserving. And oftentimes I think they're deserving of way more than what they are paid. But if you only take work based on your salary, there could be something that could come down the line that, you know, my working with Christopher Guest, for instance, you know, that was a, that was a small budget movie. They, they, didn't have any money to pay me, you know, but I was like, I fucking love Christopher Guest. He's amazing. Like Spinal Taps, like my, one of my favorite moves. I'm like, I'm doing this movie. I don't care. I'll pay to be in it. Um, parts, the size of the parts, um, you know, to do, I don't know. I got done a ton of small parts. And if it's a cool part, great. And the size of the budget of the film. I mean, a lot of people say, look, I'm, I'm only doing a blockbusters or that's i'm just gonna wait 
you know, which is, which is valid. And I think in some ways more valid than what I've done, but, but that's always been, that's always been my MO. And I think that's one of the reasons that I've gotten a chance to uh, work with all those people that you mentioned and also um, play a pretty wide variety of parts. Yeah. Well, you're, you know, you're a, uh, whether you like this term or not, you are a star. You're you're a major star, but I feel like your essence is you're an actor first. You're an artist first who happens to have had a lot of success, but you're, you, you seem to me, based on choices, based on even this conversation, it's like what, what drives you is not, uh, not necessarily the, the reward that's to come down, but actually the, just the, the experience itself, which I got to say, you know, I haven't had the choices you've had, but I, I would say that mo a lot of my situations are like the, the ones that didn't pay me were many times the ones that were most rewarding. You know, they, the people were all in for all the right reasons. And, mm -hmm. and even if the thing didn't come out the way I hoped it would, the doing of it was like a band of, you know, crazy people going after mm -hmm. this thing. And there's something really alive about that. And, and mm -hmm. really, you know, but I have a, I have a lot of those that just didn't, didn't <laughs> us, nobody ever saw, but they were fun uh, to make, you know? Right. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because when I was a little kid and when I was really making the decision about being an actor, I did it for different reasons. I did it because I wanted to be desperately wanted to be famous. I did it because I really wanted um, uh, money and I really wanted girls and I really wanted to be on magazines and be on TV shows and all those kinds of things. What was interesting was that when I, that was what drove me to saying, okay, I wanna be, I'm gonna be an actor. I went into a, an acting class um, or apprenticed at a theater, you know, when I was a, you know, young, not even a teenager, like a little kid, you know, and right away, those things became less important to me because right away I realized how hard it was, but also how nurturing it was, how therapeutic it was and how much I fucking loved it and loved it and really wanted to learn how to be good at it. You know, I really wanted to learn to be good at it. And so my whole approach really became what you're talking about, became more about the work. I mean, more like completely about the work and about about. And to this day, I think, you know, this from, you know, from us working together, I fucking love to act. I mean, like like to to be on city on a hill and and get a chance to you know walk in those crazy shoes of jackie you know it's it, every time you know we get it we get a a chance to be living in between action and cut i, I dig the shit out of it i really do yeah. still i was thinking of the irony of of you playing jackie because as i'm sitting down with you i'm like god you're really good at like you know, embracing change, em embracing, like we're talking about social media, all of this. And it's like, you're playing this character who is just desperately hanging on to the yes. old guard and the old way of working things and yes. skimming off the top. And it's, yeah. a, it's great to watch you in that role because you're, you're such a good guy off camera. You're such a, you know, you're, you're a generous guy, you're supportive. And then you, you play, I mean, he's, He's really, I mean, it's, it's great because it's so nuanced. He does have a heart, but he's a real bastard. I mean, he's like, and watching you play, I feel like when I'm watching you in that role, you're just really enjoying yourself. Mm -hmm. It seems, it seems as though there's a real joy in, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think they, they give me something good to play in pretty much every scene, you know? And so that's, that's the joy. I mean. It's like, you know, coming off of the following, you know, I hadn't really done that that much TV, right? So at all, I mean, following was the first series that I did. I, I was, you know, very re resistant of it. And there was character stuff there. Um, you know, he was a, you know, alcoholic and, uh, you know, had a lot of pain in his life and, and you know, it was constant, his life was constantly in danger, but, 
a lot of scenes just by the nature of the fact that there was information, you know, cop kind of information that had to be, you know, uh, put across and, you know, you're, you're, you know how it is, you know, you're, you're talking, you're, you're not, it's not character things that you're working on. You're working on story, you know, like uh, where's the bad guy and uh, yeah. cross town and we got to whatever, you know, yeah. uh, whatever it is, it's just, and so when you go to work, you go, okay, uh, let's see, I have four of those scenes this week. And then I've got one scene that's actually, you know, some character kind of stuff that I can sink my teeth into. Whereas on, on City on a Hill, um, you know, pretty much everything, just by the nature of the way that Jackie is just so full of shit and he talks and he just can't stop talking. Or, you know, by the fact that he's, it's they're all very character-y kind of. Yeah. So that makes it really fun. You know, like I, like basically almost every scene I'm looking forward to playing. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell. Well, it, I want to, I want to, uh, you know, I'm looking at the clock. I don't want to keep uh, you over our time, but we, I want to ask you the, the thing that you said earlier about like your original intent to get in was, was, you know, to be famous, all of that stuff. It, what's the relation of that to I read, I don't know how true it is. Your dad was like on the cover of, of time magazine in 1964, an architect or a city planner. I was, it was a city planner. He was a city planner. Yeah. Did, did that like growing up with, a, I mean, not that he, he's a celebrity the way you are, but, but growing up with a, a, a dad who had some kind of like people maybe knew who he was. Did that have a, like, to me, I look at you and Kira and you're both famous. You both, you know, she directed us last year. I've been working with you. You've directed me. She was, couldn't have been cooler. You guys seem so um, unaffected by it. Do you think that that's like in retrospect, do you think it's because you, maybe you saw your dad have to handle like a, a public <laughs> life and a private life or no? No, I think, I think, well, I, they are definitely connected. They are as connected as they possibly could be because, because my dad was, uh, you know, Philadelphia is a relatively um, small pond, but he was a real big fish there. Like he would walk down the street and people would say, Hey Ed, Hey Ed, what's going, you know, when, when's that expressway going through or, you know, whatever. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was well known and he also was very, very into his own, Fame. He would bring home his clippings and he would talk about it when the fucking Time magazine came out. I think he had like, you know, 20 copies of it or something brought home. You know, he was really into it. Um, and so my relationship to fame was inc was 100 percent formed by that and by my relationship with him. And I wanted to be more famous than him. There was no doubt about it. I, you know, they say that sometimes sons, you know, want to kick their dad's ass. And when it came to the fame thing, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick his ass. I, you know, I, I know it. And, um, and the cool thing was uh, over time was that sometimes we, we'd go down to Philadelphia and we, you know, once I was, you know, a movie star and walk down the street and someone would go, Mr. Bacon, Mr. Bacon. And I would turn around thinking that they were talking to me and they were talking to my dad. He, <laughs> you know, he had, he, that was like the greatest, that was like the greatest thing for him. That was like, you know, his favorite thing. So yeah, I, I, that was very, very influential, but I don't think that he, I don't think that he struggled with it in any way. Um, but, you know, uh, it was, it was definitely a driving factor for me. Yeah. I mean, when you say struggle, like, do you, you don't seem to struggle with it. I mean, I noticed from my, you know, I can only go by my own reaction to you. When I met you, I kind of, I almost feel like I veered away from you because I'm like, I don't want to be a pain in this guy's ass. Like you probably uh -huh. everybody's coming up and sidling up and asking questions. And I don't want to be that guy. Um, because we, at the time we weren't really in scenes together. It was like, Hey, mm -hmm. how are you? Um, mm -hmm. do you notice, you know, is it, uh, I don't even know if there's a question there, but, but I mean, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to weigh you down in any way you feel like you've kind of embraced it and and yeah the two of you together as a couple seem like you're out in plain sight and because yeah. you're accessible no nobody's bugging you well 
well, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. um, <laughs> I can I can tell you that I I I I tread lightly on this because I think that um, I don't like to look a gift horse in the mouth. Yeah, yeah. I think there's two kinds of actors: actors that want to be famous and liars. Uh, you go into this because you want people to look at you and watch you and see you. You do it. You don't. It, otherwise you know, you can just act in your room, right? I mean, I mean, you're not gonna get paid for it, but if you really don't want to be famous, I don't think you really are drawn to, to acting. It's also, it's also a fantastic acknowledgement that you've done well, that people have seen your shit, you know what I mean? Um, and so, but I would say that it is also something that is very, it's a very bizarre kind of life that you really cannot understand until you've really had it. And I've had a lot of people say to me, listen, I mean, I'm famous in my town because, you know, I, because I work at the hardware store and I go out to eat and, you know, you know, I see someone down at the diner and he says, oh, you know, I tried that washer on the thing, but it was the wrong size. And I feel like I'm a celebrity, you know, it's a, no, you're not, believe me. Yeah. It's, it, it's a very, it's a weird thing to um, live with, but I have no one to to blame but myself. I also think that it's incredibly addictive. I sometimes think they should have a twelve step program for select for for the for the desire to remain famous because you'll see time and time again. There's been a lot of kind of documentaries about it and stuff recently. You know, you can see the 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 attraction that people have to it and, and how connected people get to it in a strange kind of way. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that you have to be really careful not to believe your own legend. I also think you have to be careful not to live your life too disconnected from the people that you're going to be asked to play as an actor. Right. You know, I think that if you really live a completely isolated behind the walls thing and all your, all your friends are famous and, you know, that those aren't the cats that we're going to play you and me, you know, we're going to play working class grunts, you know what I mean? We're going to play cops and firemen and, you know, whatever else, but, but we're not going to play movie stars. Rarely are we going to be asked to play movie stars. So you have to keep yourself in so, I mean, grounded is a word I don't quite understand, but you have to set, keep yourself in, in contact with the people that you're going to be um, asked to play in order to keep your work honest and, uh, and r relatable. Um, and it's one thing that's changed, I think, a lot on a really purely practical basis uh, for, for the worse, I think, was that, you know, when I first became famous, um, out of a thousand people on the street, um, only one of them had a camera. And now out of a thousand people on the street, a thousand people have a camera. And so the, this, although the pandemic has changed this a lot for the better, <laughs> the, the selfie thing is, can get really, really, um, I mean, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, some type, you know, tribal nations or whatever, believe that it's taking a piece of your soul after, after a while, that's what it just kind of feels like, you know? Um, so that's, that has gotten a little bit kind of out of hand, I think, because, and also then it gets exasperated by the fact that everybody has all these pages and they, you know, they want to put, put it all on their, on their page. I mean, I think that, one of the hardest things about about it is, you know, Kira and I, as I said, we have no one to blame but ourselves. This is what we wanted. This is what we worked our whole lives for. This is what we, you know, fought and, you know, cried and whatever for was to, you know, be able to be known, right, for, for being an actor. Um, the children don't, uh, they didn't ask for that. They were just kind of, it was just thrust upon them. So how you navigate that in terms of like being a parent and being a famous parent is a, is a tricky sort of uh, situation. I was going to go there and just say, I think, you know, from, I didn't know anything about your kids. I mean, I guess I'm not looking into you guys, but you know, we, we spoke about them and, you know, we both kind of shared, I told you my, my son has been talking about being an actor and we've kind of mm -hmm. said like, 
yeah, keep them, keep them away from it. And you said your both of your kids have now gone into the arts, an actor, musician. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems that you guys have somehow managed to, uh, you know, to raise them in a in a way that seems pretty grounded for two famous parents. I mean, it seems like they, you know, they're good. yeah, they they they're really they are they're really solid solid human beings um who i guess there's two ways of looking at it one is that if you grow up in it that you put a lot of importance on it and the other is that you can grow up in it and have a pretty um jaded kind of perspective of what it actually means and the thing that's great about my kids is they both have a very very strong bullshit meter and you know they've seen they've seen people um come up and be friendly for all the wrong reasons and they've learned even without us telling them you know that 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 that's going to happen and now it just they're like bah, 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 bah. Yeah. You know, when the bullshit happens they 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 definitely they yeah definitely that's it's it. almost like they're armed with something that most other you know young yeah. people in this industry are probably not armed with because they've seen behind the curtain they've right. actually they were raised behind the curtain so right. they're like oh yeah we're behind the curtain Who yes yeah. and i mean i will say that one of the things i'm both of us are really proud of besides the fact that they're decent loving good human beings is also that they are uh very very hard working and um incredibly self-sufficient and uh, so that's something that we, I think we're both really proud of. I don't know how they got that, but they didn't. Well, they watched their parents do it. Let me ask you three final questions. I ask everybody, and then I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. Um, sure. the word no means what to you? <laughs> hmm. Um, I guess it's changed over time. <clears throat> I feel like it means that I can stop and reassess my position about anything. And I think that's a really good kind of lesson. Um, I, I, I think what it is, what I've learned is that no is not uh, the end of the road, you know? Did you get the part? No. Um, will you get another part? Maybe. You know? Yeah. Um, what about a, like a, any kind of phrase or mantra or something that you kind of lean on when everything goes sideways for you? Um, I guess, uh, there's no secret to longevity. Longevity is the secret. I gotta think about that one. There's no secret to longevity. Yeah. In other words, you just, if you hang in, you know, if you can just hang in, um, I mean, I will say that the, what the the reason that that works for me is that when I became an actor, there was no plan B. You know, I'm sure you've heard this before, but it really wasn't something that I was just trying. Um, and and I and and I felt like I was going to be in it. I was a long hauler. Long hauler has a has a bad connotation now with the pandemic, but basically, I was a long hauler. I, when I was, you know, 17 years old, I had decided that I would die an actor, you know? Um, so once that decision was made, uh, in some ways it made the nose easier, you know, because yes, you're right. There were going to be 10,000 of them, but but then, but then after 10,000, you know, 10,001, if I, if I know I'm going to be around yeah. sooner or later, you know, sooner or later, it's going to be that thing of like, yeah, you know, I always liked that guy. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's um, 
some older actors out there that'll say, you know, you're full of shit. I'm, I'm still, I've been at this longer than you and it's still not happening for me, but I, I don't know. That was, that. that's, that's a way that I yeah. told myself. And I think that I learned that lesson um, early on. I remember specifically doing a play at the Long Wharf and uh, it's great bunch of, I was by far the youngest person in the cast. I mean, I was like, you know, I was probably 18 and everybody was in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Never heard of any of these people. Never seen them on TV. Didn't know their names, you know, I'd read their, their you know, resumes in the playbill and they'd say, oh, wow, well, that guy did Broadway or whatever. But they were fantastic, talented, hardworking, skilled, incredibly skilled actors and it it sort of redefined my idea about what a successful actor is and I thought to myself well if you can make a living doing what it is that we do and learn and be as good as these people can be that is that's huge you know that's huge and and that was incredibly um uh impactful for me that's that's awesome. Um, I got one more. I'm going to bring mm -hmm. you in. We're right at the hour mark. If you could, <laughs> if you could, uh, if you could give your younger self advice, uh, what age would you intervene, and what would the advice be? Well, I think I can't even think of uh, how young. I mean, I they intervene out, out of the womb, and the advice would be that it's okay to take advice. You know that there are people that know shit that you don't know. You know, when I was a kid, I thought I knew fucking everything. I mean, how to be an actor, how to, you know, handle a career, what to do about publicity, um, how to do interviews. What I mean, I just, I was so, I was so cocky and I was so resistant, even in acting class, acting school, you know, I remember sitting in my acting class and going, oh my God, I'm going to do it. Then I'll try to do this, you know, singing exercise, for instance, we were talking about before, but it's bullshit. I mean, it really, these guys don't know. Um, there was a lot that I could have learned. There was a lot of things that I could have learned, both about skill, about technique, but also about career, um, publicity, uh, producing, directing, life, Jesus. Um, I feel like I came to the idea of, of looking for advice and guidance very, very late in, in life. And I think that that may have been helpful. And the truth is, is that you can look for guidance and still make your own decisions, you know, but I was just so goddamn independent for whatever reason that I just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to give up any of uh, that decision-making process, you know, to anybody else. And I think that, you know, um, that would be the advice that I would, that I would give my younger self. Now, that being said, giving that advice wouldn't mean that I would want things to go differently. You know, mm -hmm. I think things went exactly the way they were supposed to. Every single loss, every single no that came across my bow was because it was meant to happen. You know, I didn't lose parts to some other actor. Those parts were never mine in the first place. You know, um, you know, I think that uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't um, change things in terms of that, but I do think that uh, it would have been it would have been good to be able to uh, you know to 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 take and hear and 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 absorb some advice. But you know, on the other hand, it makes me very very open to it now. Well, I, that's what I was just thinking the whole time. I was like, God, I'm so surprised that this is his answer because my experience of you granted it's been the last two years or whatever is polar opposite of that you seem so open everybody that works for you from like cat to beate to susan who i just met recently are they're all so cool to kira they're they're 
everybody talks about you like, oh, he's so easy and and not, you, you know, you're very open. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. it's it's almost like maybe you had to go there to come yeah. back to the guy that you are now. So. Um, yeah, yeah that's mean, a trick yeah. question anyway. No one would take the <laughs> advice. The right. younger self would never take the advice anyway. They'd be like, get out of my face. Well, yeah, that's right. That's, that's <laughs> right. That's right. It's a trick question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Listen, Kevin, thank you. Uh, this is this has been really cool. I, I really appreciate you doing it. I know you're super busy and um, no, I appreciate uh, it. I well, think it's, it's great what you're doing. I think the uh, the concept is is awesome and, and especially um, so so valuable to people in our in our business because uh like i said it's um you know it's a it's a lifetime of, of rejection uh being an, an actor and and navigating the way to to get through that and and come out of the other side with your own sense of self and um you know without a drug or alcohol problem or you know uh, whatever else can the pitfalls can be um, I've seen a lot of people during the course of this there's been a lot of roadkill you know and uh, and I think that uh, it's it, it's 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 cool that you're doing this and I hope people are listening to it to try to uh, whatever here's some advice thanks man I, I, it means a, a ton to me and uh, you giving me the time is, is really very much appreciated so, and I hope we get another season I hope so too yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. brother. Thank they haven't you. let our stages go yet, so that's a good sign. Oh, that's a good sign. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> I like hearing that. Um, all right. Enjoy the day. Say all hello right. to Kira. 